Um, so I'd like to begin my talk the way I usually do, and that is acknowledging all the wonderful women, brilliant women I've had the opportunity to work with and men, and to also highlight Mike Posner, who really took a chance on me and helped position me to lead an institute that led to much of the work that I'll talk about today. But throughout my career, I have had stellar mentors who have challenged me, um, as well as given me opportunities to help build confidence um, in myself, which we all need when we pursue science, which there's so much uncertainty around science, and there's the highs and lows. So this is John Richards and uh, Randy uh, when I was at USC, and then I did my postdoc in uh, Judy Rappaport's branch at the NIMH. The title today is um, twofold. That is, I want to talk about cognitive neuroscience in an age of discovery and how the field itself has emerged. And it seems like every single day there's a new tool, technique, or um, form of analyses that can provide new information or a new animal model that can help constrain some of our interpretations that we're seeing in the human. But I also have been fascinated by age of discovery, and that's this period of adolescence. So while the brain changes over the life course, even beyond 75, Randy, um, to help us meet the challenges of each developmental phase, uh, which really helps us uh, to discover and learn about the environments, but it also helps our survival. Even though that's occurring across the developmental uh, life course, um, it's particularly obvious to me during adolescence when an individual has to learn to negotiate their environment without the buffer or protect or protection of the caregiver um, so that they can independently be functioning adults in society. So I'll be talking a fair amount about developmental science and particularly this period, how it informs our understanding of adolescence. And there are three key questions that I'll present brief examples of how we're beginning to address each. But um, I have a reputation for being opportunistic and highlighting former trainees and current trainees' work. And so um, these questions are giving me um, some leadway and being able to discuss work from several of those individuals. So if we first just start with how has cognitive neuroscience changed? Well, I could go down memory lane and we can actually even talk about memory and some of the first studies that um, we were able to carry out that involved functional magnetic resonance imaging with children, and I was positioned in just the right place at the NIH um, with one of the authors of the first paper that was coming up, um, coming out that gave us hints that we could begin to non-invasively look at function with um, MRI techniques. And this paper came out in 95, and it basically used an in-back task um, to assess working memory. So they either um, looked for a target uh, through the sequential presentation of stimuli, or they did a two-back version of that task, and they looked for repeats um, of stimuli. <laughs> and what we saw in this huge sample of um, six children, 9 to 11, is activity in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex um, when we looked at the contrast of the two-back versus the zero-back. We then went on to look at reproducibility of that finding, again, um, uh, in very small samples, and to see if we could reproduce that finding um, early on when this technique was emerging, and again, showing dorsolateral prefrontal cortex as well as the frontal parietal network, um, basically, was activated. Um, but I look back at this paper, and um, we didn't even do a conjunction analysis to see if there was overlap in these regions at the time. And the field has really changed dramatically since then. And now, if, um, if you look for open access data sets um, and you look around the world, we're seeing more and more emerge where we have the availability of data that we've just not had before. And we're beginning to get much more representative samples. 
So all of these blue areas are areas where studies are ongoing where at least 500 youth um, are being followed and brain imaging data is being collected as well as other phenotypic data. And this was a paper that I had to update uh, since 2018 when Monica Rosenberg first published it uh, because there have been additional studies. They really are popping up, uh, it seems like, almost weekly. But the advantage of these big data and our accessibility to them is they may speed up scientific discovery. And I'll have to say, during the pandemic, having access to data when we couldn't all collect data during that time was very important. It also hopefully is helping to democratize data access um, and importantly for our field, enhance reproducibility and replication. And again, as we get larger and more representative samples, we can begin to better inform policy as well. So one of these studies that I've been involved in, and I'll share just a couple studies today, is the um, Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development, or ABCD study. This is the largest study in the United States looking at brain development. Um, currently, we have almost 12,000 participants who are recruited when they were 9 and 10. They're being followed for 10 years. Right now, they're in their mid-teen years. Um, and they're being um, followed across 21 sites, which I've depicted those sites on the map in the upper right corner. And we're getting a varied uh, phenotypic data, um, but that also includes brain imaging data that is both structural and functional in nature. And so using data like this, I'll just illustrate from some of Monica's work, um, we can now sort of revisit what we did with that small little study in 19, that we published in 1995, looking at working memory. We can look at behavioral and neural signatures of working memory in these children. And, um, and so what Monica did is she defined working memory by using a list sorting task that was part of the NIH toolbox. Um, and it's a task that we were collecting outside of the scanner. Um, and you can look at the, how it relates to a number of other toolbox measures um, and also cognitive abilities, which include, uh, not surprisingly, fluid intelligence, um, short-term memory, reading vocabulary, uh, many of these associations that Randy uh, has examined early in his career. And I know his JEP paper, I can't remember the year it was published, has like four to 5,000 uh, citations at this point with regard to those associations of these cognitive abilities with, um, with working memory. It's also the case that performance on this list sorting task correlates with performance on the NVAC, which is another working memory task. So um, what we were able to do is to use that task, and the stimuli were um, different emotional faces and places, and to look at a contrast that compared memory load. So comparing the two back versus the zero back contrast, here you're seeing a frontal parietal network, and then seeing how that neural signature collected on the NVAC task relates to performance on the list sorting task. And here you can see those regions, again, frontal parietal network is popping up and is related to performance on the list sorting task based on activation collected during this uh, NVAC performance. And you don't see this association if you look at other contrasts with this task, such as comparing emotional and neutral faces. You also don't see the same associations when we look at other tasks that we collected, um, scans, uh, which were the stop signal task and the monetary incentive delay task. Now, this is, um, it's important to note that the other opportunity we have is to look at replication or reproducibility. And so um, when Monica looked at the first release of data that was on the first group of uh, nine and 10 year olds we recruited, and then the second release of the data that was on a slightly larger group, we see replication of these results. And again, we consistently see uh, the lack of 
of an association and the neural signatures related to other tasks or contrast with regard to our working memory measure. Now, I don't have time today, but um, perhaps when I have individual meetings or Q&A, something else that we're beginning to look at is using um, representation similarity analyses to look at neural representations and the similarity among them and how they can help explain one of the findings that we're seeing on this working memory task um, with regard to higher performance for faces during working memory, but subsequently lower performance for faces um, when we look at long-term memory of items that were in that working memory task and how we're focusing on regions that encode these to be able to predict the long-term memory that was done, um, that measure was done outside of the scanner. Um, and another aspect of ABCD I won't be able to talk about, but just want to tease you, is work by um, Erica Bush, who uh, did her undergraduate work with Jim Haxby uh, at Dartmouth. And we're taking advantage of the large twin data set uh, that we have as part of ABCD. And so she's looking at the heritability of um, unique functional uh, connectomes based on fine scale uh, connectivity patterns and looking at that during development. Instead, what I'll highlight today is I'll focus on some published work and sort of bring us forward, again, taking a bit of a historical approach to presenting these data. And um, emphasizing what we've learned from a different number of imaging modalities, uh, structural and functioning modalities. So if we just look at um, structural changes that are occurring from childhood into uh, through adolescence into adulthood, this work coming out of Judy Rappaport's branch shows this nice pattern of sensory motor regions reaching adult cortical thickness before association regions like the prefrontal cortex. You may be able to see that better looking um, down on the brain in the static image where those sensory motor regions that allow us to see and to act are developing before prefrontal regions um, that are associated with us using those abilities and seeing and acting and, um, and, and planning our actions based on goal-directed behaviors. And this maps nicely onto elegant postmortem human work, but also Pascal Rakish um, at Yale, his work looking at synaptogenesis and subsequent pruning. Um, and so we're seeing differences in the, um, at least the plateau in these areas that uh, in part map onto that work. So a number of people have suggested that it's an index of synaptic pruning and fine tuning of connections during this time. Now, all the action is not happening at the cortical level, let's be clear. Um, and this is particularly the case um, when we think about adolescence, uh, we might think more in terms of um, emotional centers of the brain uh, that might be changing. And this is old work out of Terry Jernigan's lab when Elizabeth Saul was a graduate student with her, basically showing, yes, there are changes in the prefrontal cortex, but there are subtle changes that are still taking place from childhood into adolescence. And Sarah Jane Blakemore has shown this, just looking at three different regions, the amygdala, ventral striatum, and prefrontal cortex, and showing you're reaching close to developmental asymptote earlier in these regions, um, well before what we're seeing with regard to vibes in the prefrontal cortex. Now, my work is focused more specifically on functional imaging. Um, and we are like voyeurs as adults looking inside the behaving teen brain and those individuals who have teens, of course, um, news alert, they do have a brain, although sometimes um, their actions, uh, we might question that. But in fact, their brains are probably, um, we assume their brains are, um, have been really evolutionarily hardwired um, across different phases of development, but particularly adolescence, to help us meet the challenges that we're anticipating during each of those developmental windows. And again, there are many challenges that the teenager faces 
intellectually, physically, sexually, and socially um, so much that they have to learn before they can go out um, and be an independent uh, social functioning member of the society. And so I want to highlight some work that Adriana Galvan completed when she was a graduate student because very early on, um, we were hearing our colleagues in the lay public talk about how adolescents had no prefrontal cortex. And that's why they took all these risks and did all of these things that sometimes um, could lead to fatal consequences. And since um, adolescents are very attuned and value money, we use money as a reward. And since we were interested in reward, um, we used paradigms at the time, that's built directly off of some of Wolfram Schultz's work, looking at probabilities of reward, expectations, and also the magnitude of reward. Today, I'm just going to focus on manipulations in the magnitude of reward. And what those studies showed is an adolescent-specific effect where teens had an exaggerated response in receipt of large relative to small reward, a pattern that we didn't see in children or adults, and a pattern that we don't see in areas of the frontal cortex, which is a bit more protracted in its uh, pattern with age. Now, importantly, in trying to understand how this might relate to adolescent behavior, she also looked at endorsement of engaging in risky behavior and saw an association between the magnitude of response to reward and that risk taking. And this adolescent-specific sort of heightened sensitivity to reward has been shown in a number of labs, Bea Luna's in Pittsburgh, also Evelyn Crohn's in um, Holland. And Evelyn and I had the opportunity to work briefly when she was a graduate student, and I was at Pittsburgh, um, and she was there. And she's gone on to publish just a beautiful longitudinal study um, looking at age continuously, and this was work with Barbara Brahms, uh, and they had over 250 participants, each tested at least three times. And so you see this peak and this response to um, gains versus losses in the mid-teens to the early 20s. But the question is, if you have the sensitivity to reward, how can you use that um, in benefiting the adolescent? And there's beautiful work by Juliet Davido that focuses on that. There's some earlier work that we examined when we were trying to understand when does self-control break down? Because um, it doesn't make sense to describe their behaviors being all about the prefrontal cortex because children clearly have less developed prefrontal cortex, but they don't engage in the same behaviors. So how can we use this heightened sensitivity to cues or um, that might be related to positive outcomes, and particularly for adolescent social cues? Uh, are important as there's a strong peer influence during this time. And we use NIM STEM that were developed by my former graduate student, NIM Tottenham. And so what Leah showed is that just like with monetary reward, when you presented these positive social cues, you saw an adolescent specific response um, to these smiling faces that was not observed for either the children or the adults. And importantly, this pattern parallels the degree of impulsivity that we see in adolescents, that, that parallels that activity in the ventral striatum. We see that they make many more false alarms um, to rare smiling cues than they do neutral cues. So this is a specificity to the, the type of cue that they're being presented with. And we don't see that pattern in children and adults. And if we look more broadly, what we see is um, like a stepwise, if we plotted this continuously, almost a, a linear change in recruitment of lateral prefrontal regions that have been associated with response inhibition, if you lesion that area, they have difficult time on impulse control tasks. And what we see is they are activating that area more on correct trials um, when they're younger than when they're older and their performance improves as a function of age across all stimuli. We just see the specificity when we compare the positive social cues to neutral ones. We can also look at um, how well we can regulate ourselves 
And this is work in collaboration with the late Walter Michelle and Kevin Oxner. It was really driven by Jen Silvers, who's now a faculty member at UCLA. And just looking at reappraisal of appetitive cues, um, and I haven't had breakfast or lunch, so um, this chocolate chip cookie is looking very appealing to me right now. But what you can see in this graph is that with age, we get better at regulating our cravings um, and if we use these strategies to imagine them as far as opposed to up close, um, we can do even better. And if we look at the neural correlates of that, what we see is that with age, you see less activity of this area of the vitreal striatum that I've been talking about with age and greater activation of frontal parietal systems implicated in control. Now, everything's not fun and games. Um, and Todd Hare, actually wanted to look at the response to negatively uh, balanced emotions. And um, what he observed is that adolescents show this heightened and more variable response to cues of potential threat, these fearful faces. Um, Chris Monk had shown that previously in adolescents compared to adults. He showed the specificity of that change during this period. And importantly, he also showed that um, this magnitude that we're seeing, um, with each repetition and presentation of these stimuli, what you would expect is with re those repeated presentations, you'd go, all right, already, like nothing's happening to me, even though fearful faces usually suggest there's some danger around, there is none. But individuals who showed continued activation with these repeated presentations of those fearful faces, and some who even showed sensitization or increases over time, endorsed higher great anxiety. And we'll come back to that in a minute. If we look at the neural circuitry, this ability to, for lack of a better term, um, habituate that amygdala response, we see that's associated with increased or um, this inverse coupling between the medial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. And that fits nicely with subsequent work out of Nim Tottenham's lab and with Dylan G as her graduate student, Dylan is also a postdoc of mine, where they show that you get this switch or flip in positive coupling between the amygdala and prefrontal cortex and subsequent uh, negative um, or inverse coupling between these regions. And if we take this one step further, we can look at how can you regulate this with cognitive appraisal. Again, another study um, with Jen Silvers. And again, what she shows is with age, we get better at reappraising and feeling less negative when we view images, particularly when we're reappraising those images. And with age, we see less uh, amygdala activity with reappraisal. And what Jen found is that lateral prefrontal cortex was mediating this change um, in this association between age and the amygdala. But the most exciting data that I, um, that I felt in this research was really how different underlying circuits might be changing across development, but possibly in a hierarchical way. So when she looked more carefully, what she saw is that the association between the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, that that was moderated by connectivity between the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and amygdala. Again, I think this may be consistent with developmental changes that we're seeing in this circuitry with age and may suggest that the development of cortical subcortical circuits may need to um, mature to an extent to help instantiate subsequent development of more cortical cortical circuitry here involving lateral and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So we had a relatively simple um, model, the imbalance model, that was based on changes in circuitry and a lot of Adriana Galvan's early work, but it was very similar to a dual system model, almost as if we were talking about the prefrontal cortex and subcortical systems as orthogonal. But in fact, it was more like for you Trekkie fans, um, the communication between Spock, the more balkanized part 
of the brain, prefrontal, to use John Cohen's terminology, and then emotional centers that were more like Captain Kirk, who often made decisions, you know, fly by night, and that sometimes seemed illogical to Spock. But it wasn't that they were working separately. It was how they were connecting and speaking to one another. And Spock would rarely speak to the captain unless he was doing something illogical or the captain called on him. So thinking about how these systems may need to change radically in order to initiate the subsequent projections and communications back to them. So we've developed a hierarchical model that extends this imbalance view. And there's evidence both that we've been looking at animals and humans that suggest that we might see predominantly subcortical connections changing before we ultimately see these cortical-cortical development where circuits are better able to communicate with one another to drive behavior and to help regulate behavior. So this suggests now that we have different stages within adolescence where a teen may look very different from a 17- and 18-year-old or a 19- and 20-year-old, which I'm going to call late adolescence, and I might refer to it as young adulthood at some stage. But Leah Somerville had this beautiful article in Neuron. The title was In Search of the Neural Signature of Brain Maturity, which for neuroscientists that gives you kind of the willies because maturity sort of sounds like stability, and we think of the brain as plastic throughout the life course. But what she illustrated in this paper is depending on the imaging modality, the point in time where you saw developmental asymptote really varied. So if you look at functional connectivity or cortical thickness or how white matter tracts are changing, you see that those can extend well beyond 18, which is when legally we consider an individual adult in this country in terms of when they can sign documents without needing an adult or caregiver to co-sign with them. But the one thing that you also see across these studies is that the prefrontal cortex does tend to show the most extended or protracted development over this time, regardless of the modality that you're looking at. But because it's connected to other nodes and regions of the brain, if it's changing, surely they are. But they're just under threshold in terms of being able to detect those changes. So in sort of sticking with this theme of when is the brain mature, as part of a collaborative project, Tim Brown wanted to take all the neuroanatomical data that we were collecting on a sample. It was close to 1,000, but I think he had usable data for almost 900 participants from three, that should be three to 20 years, and basically showed if you throw in all the anatomical data, this would include diffusion-weighted images, T1, T2, and you look at how those vary with age, can you come up with a model that could predict true age? And while I think this is interesting that we can predict true age, the graph that I love is the one that shows just how dynamic development is, because at each age, there are different measures that are contributing to that model and defining what age an individual is. And so I don't know if you can see this carefully, but basically just a punchline, gray matter signal intensity within subcortical regions appears to be strongest and a stronger predictor in this model during early and middle childhood, whereas diffusivity within these regions is the strongest predictor during late adolescence. So it's all variable and important to keep in mind. We can also look at functional connectivity and see when does the brain look like it's relatively mature. And this is early work by Nico Dosenbach, where he came up with a maturational index based on functional connectivity. And basically looking across networks and how connections among these networks changed, strengthened, and weakened with age, he showed this functional connectivity maturation index that you see to the right. So basically you have a good idea 
of looking at these data in terms of how a child's functional pattern may be different from an adult's. But another thing I just want to note is you're continuing to see this change and not really reaching somewhat of a plateau until the early 20s. Now, both of these studies that I've just mentioned, one looking at anatomical and another looking at the functional connectome at rest, aren't really looking at the behaving individual. And so maybe what we need to think about when we look at the brain is to treat it like a cardiologist with the heart and use like a stress test. But what we want to do is probe those networks in emotionally arousing situations that teens and adolescents tend to find themselves. So I want to describe a study in collaboration with Damien Fair and Mark Rudolph, where we probed functional networks under conditions of emotional arousal and see how they changed as a function of age and whether or not our model worked across development when we looked at these different emotional states. And so basically what Mark did is he developed a model where he trained to settle the majority of the subjects, about 148, between the ages of 8 and 26. And he was trained them during no real state of arousal. They were just engaged in a task, but they didn't think anything was going to happen to them during that task. And he came up with a model that could predict true age of the individual that looked relatively well, it performed relatively well. So we then looked in the independent sample and to see how well this model would work in a neutral state or in a negative and positive arousing state. And the negative state was hearing this aversive sound that we had shown was associated with high galvanic skin response and also was rated as aversive. And the positive state was winning, thinking they were going to win up to $100, but they didn't know when and they didn't know how much. It had nothing to do with their performance. And the same thing was true for the negative state. It had nothing to do with their performance. They didn't know when or how loud the sound would be. We told them it was computer generated. And if we look at how the model did, it did okay and it clearly did better for the neutral state, but it's doing less well in predicting the true age of an individual when they're under emotional arousal. And so while we can learn a lot from these models, what I always like to ask is, hey, so like where did the model fail? And like what age are we not, does the model not really capture what we're seeing in the changes in the brain with age? And if you look, what was happening is during this window, the adolescents, where the model was failing, and this is plotted relative to the neutral data, where it was failing was in predicting adolescents to be younger than they were based on the functional connectome during these emotionally arousing states. But something else you'll notice is there's a lot of variability here. So there are a number of individuals who are showing this less mature functional connectome. And so the question is, how is that related to behavior? And so Mark and Damien wanted to look at risk preferences. And so what I'm going to show you is self-endorsed reported risk preferences for individuals. If it's an open bar, it means that they were predicted to be younger than they truly were based on their functional connectome and emotional arousing state. And if they're closed or filled, that's someone who was predicted to be older. And what you can see is generally individuals who are predicted to be younger are showing higher risk preferences. But this is particularly true during this period of 18 to 21 years, or what we're beginning to refer to as late adolescence. So continuing to show changes in the brain and also preferences in behavior that are changing and extending into the early 20s. So from the cognitive neuroscience, that's been helping us to begin to understand how the brain is really dynamic and nonlinear in the way that it's changing. So a little child's brain is not just a smaller version of an adolescent and an adolescent a smaller version of an adult. They're really these nonlinear changes that we're seeing that are dynamic. We think that those changes are helping to underlie nuanced changes in behavior 
that help with the demands on the individual at each of those developmental stages, and that they're clearly going to continue into adulthood. So um, I also just want to briefly address how cognitive neuroscience is beginning to inform interventions for or treatment of the developing brain and mind. Um, and this brings back an important point of how cognitive neuroscience um, has really been moving into trying to predict behavior and outcomes. So let me just start with early identification and prevention as one example, and one real risk factor in the United States um, is that of obesity. And if you look from the 1980s to 2010, you see that there's been a dramatic increase, and even if we look more recently, 2018 stats that I had, it's at 42 percent of adults are obese in the United States. So this begs the question for understanding risk for obesity and how we might be able to prevent it, because typically a risk factor for adult obesity is associated with childhood obesity. And Christine Rapuano joined my lab as a postdoc, and she arrived with just this wonderful program research where she was looking at reward and control circuitry that had been implicated in not only um, obesity, risk for obesity, but also for alcohol abuse and other things. Um, but here she was focusing on the influence of food ads um, on our behavior, on providing calorie information in terms of what we would eat, and also genetic predispositions. But really the question I had for her is sort of, what are the possible mechanisms um, driving this? And so when she had arrived, there had been a paper that had come out by Stephanie Fulton um, that just uh, really captured um, my imagination, our imagination, in terms of this area of the nucleus accumbens in the rodent. This is the same ventral striatum area that I've been talking about in humans, or, uh, uh, somewhat equivalent. And um, basically showing that depending on what you eat, um, that could really impact the brain with regard to neuroinflammation in that region of the nucleus accumbens, which could then lead to subsequent behaviors related to to additional poor eating. So let me just unpack this um, in a, this model in a simple way. So if you eat this saturated high-fat diet, um, that leads to increase in um, uh, neuroinflammation of the nucleus accumbens, which is then associated with the mice compulsively seeking sucrose, and they also showed depressive-like behaviors. And so it looked like it was a vicious cycle in terms of what we eat. You know, you are what you eat, and there's been a whole lot of work about relationships between the gut and the brain. And so I'm mentioning this because the te imaging techniques are evolving, so we can begin to look at not only macrostructure, which I've been talking about so far, but we can begin to look at microstructure. And so based on um, advances that are, are happening with diffusion-weighted imaging, where we usually think about how water molecules are diffusing more easily along a track as opposed to across tracks, we can also look at that diffusion within a cell relative to outside of a cell. So you're going to get more restricted diffusion within a cell than in extracellular space. Let me see if I can unpack this a little bit more. So here, the more neurons and glial cells that you have, the more restricted diffusion relative to the hinder that's associated with extracellular space. And this has been histologically validated in a, a wonderful paper by White and Underdale's team um, uh, several years back. So the reason why we're interested in this is neuroinflammation leads to reactive gliosis. So that is this increase in glial cells in that area of neuroinflammation. So our question was, um, is the cell density, as measured using RSI, is that cell density in the nucleus accumbens related to weight gain in children? And so looking at all subcortical, um, several subcortical regions, what Christina found is that the nucleus accumbens was associated with individual difference in waist circumference. This is also true for body mass index. Um, there are reasons I could discuss and why uh, waist circumference might be better at this age. Um, but more importantly, the nucleus accumbens was associated with change in waist circumference after one year. And this is just showing you the spatial specificity um, of these findings in cell density within the nucleus accumbens. 
And then the next question we had is dietary fat. How is that related to waist circumference? We see an association there, but Christina went on to show that the cellularity in the nucleus accumbens was mediating this association between dietary fat and waist circumference. So these data together are consistent with the animal work, suggesting this vicious cycle that is associated with what we eat, its effects and impacts on the brain that subsequently can impact behavior that again leads to eating poorly. So the findings can inform identification and prevention strategies to some extent, but I wanted to highlight this because it's one of those advances in neuroimaging tools that allow us to really look at the microstructure and see how that's predicting outcomes. We can also begin to look at how we can use neuroimaging data for diagnostics or treatment. And I want to highlight work from two of my former trainees, MD-PhD students. Connor was a faculty member at the time that Andrew was a graduate student with me. And with over a thousand scans of individuals with depression and controls, they wanted to see if they could identify biomarkers or subtypes of depression just based on neural signatures. And I just want to say from the get-go, because I think this is really important, that these types of depression could not be differentiated based on the Hamilton D, which is a typical used often as a clinical outcome measure. However, these subtypes were associated with different clinical symptomatology. So if I just highlight a couple, anhedonia was associated with one biotype, whereas anxiety was predominantly associated with another. But the reason why we want to be able to begin to explore different neural signatures that might suggest subtypes of disorders that have very broad phenotypes, you can have too much sleep, too little sleep, eat too much, eat less, is if that's going to inform treatment. And so a subset of these individuals had been treated with TMS. And what Andrew was able to show is that certain biotypes were more responsive to this transcranial magnetic stimulation, both in terms of the response rate and also their improvement in depression and severity. So that's one example of where the field is beginning to go. There's much more work to be done. This is done in adults, and I just want to highlight some developmental work that's been in collaboration with Charles Glatt, Francis Lee, and really driven largely by Siobhan Patwell, who's now on the faculty at the University of Washington. And this is in that area of anxiety and stress-related disorders because they're so prevalent in young people, with estimates of as many as one in four being impacted. And it also builds on early work that Katie Thomas showed with our group, where there was an exaggerated amygdala response in anxious children to those fearful cues I showed you before. And the magnitude of this response was associated with severity of those symptoms. But the data that I presented to here that was a more recent study sort of begs the question of, is this an exaggerated response, or is it just reflecting that the pattern of activity may not be habituating or decreasing with repeated exposures to these faces? Because, again, what Todd had shown is that ability or that observation that we see a decrease in response to these cues with repeated presentations is associated with less trait anxiety. And those individuals who don't show a decrease or actually show an increase endorse higher trait anxiety. And also, just to remind you that this involved ventral, prefrontal, and amygdala functional connectivity. So this sort of begged the question for us in thinking about how we could drill down a little bit deeper with animal work and begin a number of collaborative studies, because the circuitry has been implicated in fear extinction and fear regulation in mice. And also, we know that facial expressions can be interpreted many different ways, and that can be influenced by our experiences and also our cultures. And also, across development, looking at faces is not really that controlled, because adults are going to have more exposure to faces than a young child. 
um, just by the nature <laughs> of age and experiences as social beings that we are, but also um, individuals with anxiety, um, given the heritability of many of the anxiety disorders, um, a child may also be experiencing more fearful expressions from their mother as they go out and explore too. So we, we wanted to try to control for that using um, fear conditioning. And this is work by several wonderful graduate students and postdocs, just to name a few, Siobhan again, Stephanie Tahu, and also uh, Kate Hartley, now a faculty member at NYU. First, they show that it's easy to learn a fair memory um, and to form that. It just takes a few associations of an aversive sound uh, with a cue where um, you get these nice differential skin conductance response to the cue that was associated with the aversive stimulus relative to the one that was not. And the same thing is true with mice. It only takes a few trials for them to very quickly learn that a tone is associated with a foot shock. So we then wanted to look at this stickiness. How well can they habituate during um, childhood, adolescence, and adults? Um, uh, and how can they extinguish that fear of memory when you only present the conditioned stimulus alone? And this was compelling work both in humans and mice. Um, our team showed that adolescents have diminished acute fear extinction. So in the mice, the amount of freezing did not change very much over time. They were still freezing as much. So this is a different score. Also in adolescents, they were still showing elevated um, skin conductance responses to cues that had previously been associated with an aversive stimulus, even though it wasn't being presented. So this begs the question of, um, given that cognitive behavioral therapy that uses exposure um, components to that therapy really builds on the basic principles of fear conditioning. So we thought if adolescence is a time in which we're seeing diminished cued fear extinction, does that mean we're gonna see less efficacy of CBT that has uh, exposure component. And Andrew Drysdale looked at this. I first just wanna uh, mention that um, Rick Richardson's lab had shown this the year before in rodents. Um, so we were just extending that in the mouse, but also showing it in humans. And there've been several replications in humans as well. But what Andrew Drysdale showed is using data from um, a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it only had a, a few weeks of exposure therapy as part of that CBT trial, but he saw diminished, non-significant, but a diminished uh, effect size in the adolescents relative to the pre-adolescents. And um, that study was a developmental one, so he looked in the adult literature to find an equivalent effect size and seeing that it was a bit higher for adults. This work, has actually led to a number of groups trying to think about how can we bypass or use compensatory alternative circuitry to help diminish cued fear memories. Um, that might be important for individuals with anxiety and stress-related disorders that have a specific trigger that we might wanna target and desensitize. And so Dave Johnson and I building on Marie Monfi and Daniela Schiller's great work when they were with Joe Ledoux and Liz Phelps and looking at sort of bypassing um, the prefrontal cortex and rather than with extinction, you basically are teaching them, a, a you're learning a new memory. Now that tone that used to be associated with a shock is now safety. So you have the fear memory and the safety memory and they're um, competing. But what Marie, and, um, and Daniela were trying to show is you can actually change the memory itself just based on the timing of when you do the extent, extinction, when the memory seems to be more um, malleable and changeable. Um, we know memories are dynamic, they're, um, they're not uh, static, and so changing the memory itself. There's also been work by Siobhan where she paired um, extinction of a cue with um, placing them back in the chamber in which they were originally conditioned and got a, a bigger bang for her buck, uh, that is putting them back in the original situation in which those fear memories formed. And I think this is important with regard to virtual reality um, approaches that are beginning to be used in the clinic um, to try to help with PTSD and symptomatology. And then Dylan G um, has been using safety signals so during extinction, 
she'll pair a safety signal with the cue that was associated previously with an aversive event. And she's seeing this nice um, decreased galvanic skin response, but also an increase in activity of ventral hippocampal circuitry. So the last I want to just briefly mention is there's treatment in terms of medicine and there's treatment in how we treat individuals in our legal system. And um, unfortunately, many youth come into contact with our legal system during this extended period of adolescence. And I'll just highlight it there. You see it's in the early to mid-teens through the early 20s. And um, as I mentioned before, age and majority model assumes that you have full adult capacity by 18. Um, so that suggests that by 18, we have cognitive capacity at that point. This doesn't mean that um, individuals younger than 18, just based on what we know from psychology uh, and neuropsychology, that they have, um, don't have the comparable ability adult to make some simple decisions. We know that from very basic cognitive tasks. But Ali, um, hypothesis was that you'd see more protracted development of cognitive capacity in these emotionally arousing uh, situations. And um, basically to do that, she used conditions both rewarding and negatively affecting. And what um, she showed is that uh, um, one was the sustained threat of that loud sound and another was these fear cues. And she saw that 18 and 21 year olds, just like teens, um, were significantly different in their cognitive performance relative to individuals over 21. And when you look at the neural correlates of that, you see less activity in lateral prefrontal regions and increased activity in limbic uh, cortical regions uh, in these two age groups. This begs the question of when does adolescence end? And also how should we be treating young people in the justice system and there are a number of examples of how the system is changing. We have young adult courts developing across the country. We have experimental young adult units, um, which are less about being punitive and more about preparing the individual to be released. And it's showing promise in terms of positive interactions with officers and inmates. But I think the point here is that in the eyes of the law, um, a young adult is, uh, is not a juvenile, but in the eyes of developmental scientists, they are similar to juveniles in very important ways. And there are also efforts to extend the death penalty from 17 to 18 or 19 in terms of uh, its banning. So I just wanna end um, by saying, I hope I've given you a flavor of how the field is changing with a few examples of how it's changed, particularly since 1995. Um, and the importance of how these discoveries are beginning to inform policy that can improve the lives of young people. And by improving their lives, we're also improving our society. And to just end on using these big data sets, with them come a lot of opportunities, but big, big, big responsibilities. And we have to be aware that the social structure in which these individuals live and have been assessed is typically not captured in these data. Um, and to always remember the brain is plastic um, and we have the potential for change. So just to acknowledge, support my fabulous lab and my son who has given me a unique insight into the extended period of adolescence. I thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Um, so we are pretty much out of time, but maybe we can do a a couple of quick questions. Um, so Sherman Jones um, had a question earlier that he put in the chat. Um, Sherman, if you're there, do you want to unmute and, and ask a question? Yeah. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, awesome. um, you have mentioned how dietary changes affect the brain. And there are essentially maybe withdrawals if you take away like these fatty or these sugary diets. I was just wondering if you we're aware of similar research on how your diet changes your gut microbiome and how your gut microbiome affects the kind of foods you want to eat. Um, how your diet affects, I'm sorry, what? Oh, your microbiome, right? No, there's a whole area of research um, that I'm fascinated by, but it's not an area that I have expertise in. But thank you for mentioning that because we really are learning that, you know, just like we don't separate brain and mind, we cannot separate the brain and the gut, right, and the mind. Um, so very important. Thank you, Sherman, and good to meet you virtually. <laughs>
I had a really quick question. So you, you showed a lot of data on what is essentially U-shaped curves. So children look one way and then uh, in adolescence something happens and you know they look very different and then adults actually, children and, and, adult, and adults are actually more, more similar to each other. Now I was wondering, do you think some of these things are culturally specific? I mean, at least one of the studies was in mice, so it's not <laughs> culturally specific, but, but it seems to me that maybe some of them are, that in, in other cultures you may not see that, that distinction. So I think that's really important. Um, Larry Steinberg has done a lot of work, cross-cultural work, looking at risk-taking and the influence of peers, and he's shown across a number of, um, of countries that you see this inverted view in terms of sensation seeking and reward and also shows, I can believe this, in mice, mice who are with a peer or a cage mate um, spend more time by a nozzle um, that they can get ethanol or you know basically drink than an adult would when they're with a cage mate and they spend a whole lot of time uh, you know allowing these mice to grow together but I think that really speaks to changes that we're seeing um, in behavior uh, and the, the brain data, I think, are speaking for themselves. It's getting us away from thinking about growth and thinking about dynamic processes among um, uh, networks and nodes that are changing during this time. And uh, apologies that um, I was trying to highlight as many of my former trainees as, as possible, because um, I really do yeah. love the Q&A. <laughs> Yeah, it was absolutely great. Um, maybe maybe last question, uh, and, and, and thank you, that was, uh, yeah, thank, thank you for that answer. So Ishan, um, type the question, Ishan, do you want to unmute, or if not, I can also read the question. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for the wonderful talk. Um, my question was, uh, in terms of the structural or functional signatures of changes in the brain during adolescence, are there any studies which focus on like subspaces or subsets of regions or functional connections taken together rather than individual changes in the regions or individual set of connections between regions? Um, so looking at clusters as opposed to, uh, so, you know, it really depends on how you parcelate the brain, right? So you can look at networks or you can look at regions or um, we've begun to, um, work with Jim Haxby using hyperalignment, and we're beginning to move from sort of regions or parcellations to um, vertex to vertex to get this really fine grain functional connectivity. And we haven't used that to look at um, the changes during the adolescent period, but we have begun to look at that in the developmental population, looking at heritability versus reliability and how that is related to predictions of cognitive performance. Not sure that really addresses your question, but. Um, I, uh, I appreciate it. And maybe we can email um, and have a discussion subsequently, since we, it looks um, like we're out of time. Surely, thank you.